I have sort of a dreamy idea of how cubicles got started and I think it was invented by a guy who had to come up with sort of a dynamic office space or like a new idea for office space for the World's Fair. It was probably some uh, accounts receivable guy or whatever deciding to save money by squeezing four people into a space that should only hold two. And so he invented it for the World's Fair and then somebody figured out that it was like an amazing, cheap um, way of, of um, building offices. So they did and he was just horrified because it was just this one-time thing. On his deathbed he apologized for unleashing like the single worst evil on the world because he never, he never meant for it to happen. That guy. These are like Legos, you know? Because the ends actually come off so that they can be rearranged. They're, they're totally like Lego pieces. People very commonly refer to it as the cubicle. And in fact, uh, that's a bit of a misnomer. It's really systems furniture. Uh, and we say systems because in its original intent and design, it's really a kit of parts that you can assemble and disassemble and reassemble in any number of configurations. The designer, Bob Probst, actually identified the four-walled cubicle as the worst possible application of the concept. One, two, three, four. I'm in my fifth cubicle. I have worked in this particular cubicle for two years. I've worked in this building for six. I just got back from living in West Africa, where I was working, and needed a job. And this sort of was an easy, temporary solution. I had an office, my first job. And I've gone to the cubicle, then the inner cubicle, and now I'm in a pod. When one talks about a cubicle and you think about, you know, being in this little confined box, then the challenge you have is not to see your life as being that box, not to see your job as being that box, not to see your destiny as being that box. Because, I mean, you know, we drive to work in a box, we then work in a box, we then go home and watch a box. And before we know it, they bury us in a box. One of the problems about working in a cubicle, and I learned this when I first began working, is that regular pins or thumbtacks don't work. These, these are a strange surface. And so there's a special kind of pin that you have to buy. And immediately I went out and bought lots of those pins. I have this really old apple. It's a gala apple that I should have thrown away a long time ago. But, um, it hasn't started attracting flies yet, so I'm just going to leave it there for, I don't know, a reminder of how short life is. The only thing that I have is a mouse pad that I, well, I basically look at every day, and it's a photo of Albert Einstein. This is a piece of cowhide, and um, I use the suede side rather than the tan side. I find that it's a surface that is better and not as cold as this a plastic steel uh, construction and I like it that it doesn't have square edges it's it's a natural shape I like it when people have a lot of papers and like in and out boxes because it makes them look like they're just such intense workers I like to scatter pencils around and clipboards that's work stuff that's work poop every Friday at around 4 30 I pack up my bag I put in all my work shoes and whatever other personal items which is None. It's my chewing gum that sits on my desk. And I delete my browsing history and leave thinking there's no way I'm coming back on Monday. And every Sunday night I think, I'll just set my alarm and if I wake up then I'll go. And 
it's been two months of that. My day starts with multiple snoozes. Snooze, snooze, snooze. So once I drag myself into the office, um, I usually spend half an hour adjusting. It takes my computer probably 15 minutes to actually turn on and get started. And then I go to my desk and I check my email and I check my blog and I check my Twitter and my Facebook and I check other people's blogs and then I check the gossip sites, and then, uh, then I check my work email. I am a product manager, so what I do, my product is um, loyalty currency, so I put points on things. So I put points on uh, credit cards, and I put points on stuff in stores, and points. So yes, I do documents in the virtual world, then I, there, we have a lot of paper documents, there's a documents control room that I, Look, internationally, it's not a room, it's just a couple of cupboards with a key that I have because I'm the quality assurance manager. I left a job where I worked a lot harder and I made less money, so now I'm, I'm making more for doing what I think is like what a monkey could do. And what I'd say to people is, um, whatever you're doing, do it so that you become what I call preeminent in that task. You become the benchmark by which all others are judged. So let's say you're just a call center op operator and you have to field incoming customer complaints. How do you do that in such a way that you become the standard of excellence as far as that job is concerned? Because if you say my mission from whatever time I start till whatever time I finish, if my mission is to make what I do the definition of how this job should be done, then that becomes your reality. Then it really doesn't matter whether I've got this much space on either side of me or this much space on either side of me. In the 60s, in Germany, when Germany was recovering from the Second World War, there was a great burst of economic energy. Two brothers, in fact, called the Schnellers, uh, reacted against the uh, conventional German offices of those days, which were uh, rather ordinary, um, pretentious buildings on the whole, uh, and invented a concept very much shaped by um, the ideas of cybernetics. If you drew a map of the and between the nodes in a cybernetic system, you would have a pattern of information. When this movement first started in Germany, there, were, there wasn't systems furniture, you just took tables and file cabinets, and, and there were a few uh, curved partitions that were used. And, um, so I have a, an image of, of one of these you know, plans, which looks, uh, certainly doesn't look tailorist in, in its um, mechanistic organization. It looks, uh, if anything, totally anarchical. What happened next was that these ideas were imported into the United States. The Schnellers had a, an office in New Jersey. A very fine uh, furniture designer uh, working for Herman Miller, uh, although he was independent, uh, called Robert Probst, did some studies of the detailed studies of the nature of work uh, and lit upon the idea, which sort of was influenced, I think, by office landscaping, of the idea that you could have screens from which shelves could be hung and equipment and a desktop. The original concept for systems furniture, as Bob Probst envisioned and as Herman Miller initially mar marketed, was that it would be, um, if you were looking at it from plan view, in other words from above, that you would see a series of organic shapes that would define individual workstations. 
you would never have a sort of hard 90 degree angle uh, in your space, which tended to sort of give you a sense of, uh, of a limitation and a finite end. He wanted to see 120 degree angles that gave you a more of a, uh, of a distant sight line and yet still gave you some definition of space. And again, it was non-orthogonal. It was uh, organic uh, and it did some wonderful uh, propositions and that was called Action Office Furniture. I think I was there more or less at the moment when Action Office turned into the cube. Because of the natural way that buildings are laid out in grid-like form and because architects and designers are looking to apply a product in a way that's readily understood, simple, easy to do in plan design, that quickly became the dominant form of application. If you can imagine in a crystal a fluid that crystallizes and suddenly in the petri dish the uh, what would have been fluid before suddenly goes like that that's what happened the logic of the orthogonal uh, space saving logic i suppose took over and the cube emerged screen based furniture in an orthogonal pattern uh, which was the basis for uh, the next 40 years of office design in north america In terms of the actual physical workspace, nobody likes working in a cubicle. After eight hours working in this environment, I am baked, tired, um, you know, you're thirsty, the air is dry. Uh, I think sometimes it's more dry in an office building like this than in the desert. Tests have been done. The plants prove it. But sometimes if it's too nice, then what it might do is take some of the urgency away, might take some of the kind of basic um, austerity away and send the wrong message. Um, and I actually think that there's some merit in not making uh, one's office uh, too attractive because then you just want to spend time there. You know, in Dirty Harry, and I'm quite eclectic in my influences here, um, Clint Eastwood, who played the role, had a great quote. He said, never trust a man whose ass is the same shape as his chair, right? In other words, don't sit in one space for too long. You just, you just lose your mojo. You know, sitting in these chairs, you don't walk enough, you don't get enough exercise. And basically, by the end of the day, as a physical person, you, you just, you're tired. I have shooting pains, like, absolutely terrifying shooting pains that start in my shoulder and end up in my eye. And I even saw a doctor about it because I thought I was getting a palsy because uh, one side of my face was going numb and I was like, I think that I have a, a Bell's palsy. And he said, no, you just should stretch and, and work out. Um, which is fine, fair enough, I still think I have a bit of Bell's palsy that I got from the computer. Now, if you're sitting at the computer for a long period of time, it's important to get up and stretch every now and then. So a good stretch for uh, a computer user to do would be a stretch that requires the opposite of what your work causes you to do. So let's bring the right hand 
onto the left handle of the chair and begin to work into a very gentle twist. Inhaling, lengthening, and exhaling. Try to begin from the base of the spine. Inhale, lengthen, exhale, move into the ribs this time. Inhale, though um, these walls aren't permanent or uh, there isn't a door or they go up to the ceiling, they still offer a certain amount of privacy and closure that, oddly enough, takes me out of the workplace and in wherever I want to be in my head. If you are going to get the most out of people, how do you put them in a space where they're more likely to bump into other people, where they're more likely to talk to other people? And so more and more, the, um, the trend is to go open space. The trend is to take down the walls, literally and then figuratively, to facilitate as much interaction as possible. So even the word cubicle may be an obsolete word. My boss is over there, my colleague is over there, and then somebody, sort of a hoteling person who visits, sits over there. And there's a big um, table in the middle. So we come together, we roll together for meetings, and then we roll back when we're done. There'll be times when, like, my boss is talking to my colleague and they're talking about the Bruce Springsteen concert, and then I don't want to talk about it. But I, I'm sort of facing them, and so, like, I don't know, so I'm sort of inching away. I'm always like looking back and then trying to like get, I'm just going to type now and then eventually I can break free. You, you do see other things aside from the rectangle that represents the monitor. So I could see while even looking at my monitor, I could see the monitor of my colleague. And at one point in time, I saw these phenomenal photos of nuclear explosions. In, in the end, I think they're... I got the link, so I think there are like some hundred photos. So she was just scrolling down and they're all connected to each other. I don't know why, but uh, that's just the formatting. And it's just scrolling down from one version of a nuclear explosion to another. Um, just, it's really cool, cool to see on, on a work computer. Wherever you are and whoever you are, your natural inclination more and more needs to be, I'm going to be the one who reaches out. I'm going to be the one who, you know, stands up and extends my arm of friendship and openness. It is a common misperception that if you lower the, the panel height or the partition height, uh, remove walls between people, that they automatically communicate more uh, or better. Uh, there is really no social science evidence to support the idea that people will communicate more just because you take the walls away. Um, and in fact, of course, we know what it does in terms of distraction and ability to concentrate and, and attention and all of that. Um, so it's, I'm afraid, getting used often as a, an excuse to save some money because when I make a wall shorter or use less of them, I spend less money. Uh, and so, I, I, well, I can save you money and you'll communicate more all at the same time. Not necessarily true.
since you're there for a third of your day and your other third is sleeping and your other half of that rest of your third is getting ready for work and going to work and coming home, then yeah, it should probably be something that you enjoy doing. If I could do anything, I would be... <sighs> I'd be singing around the world. I always wanted to be a cook, but my mom told me that I had to get a degree before I ruined my life. <laughs> so that kind of nipped that in the bud. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to have shrapnel in my leg. I wanted to go to war-torn countries. That was like, there was no question. That's what I was going to do. And I'll never forget, and actually an acting coach in, um, or an acting professor in college said um, to our class, he said, don't, don't go to New York and get a full-time job and expect to be able to act. Because as soon as you get insurance, as soon as you get a regular check on a regular basis, you're going to have difficulty pulling away from that and going to that kind of lifestyle where you're auditioning and you're babysitting or you're walking dogs or um, you're part-time here, you're part-time there so you can continue to audition. You can't go into a full-time job and still try to pull that off. And for some reason I thought I could. I thought I could be the exception. And I wasn't. It's a demanding thing when you have to get up every day at seven o'clock or six o'clock even, and you work all day, like, and then you want to maintain personal relationships. It's very hard to find the time to pursue other things. So, I mean, that's where you get fucked up. It's not the job doing it to you. It's that you just don't have the buckle down or the, the desire or the fire within <laughs> to really pursue that, you know? No matter how bad it gets, it's not that bad compared to other places in the world. This is not the Gaza Strip, right? This is not, this is not South Africa. This is not even China. This is not a place where they can come and take you in the middle of the night and nobody knows where you've gone and they'll never find you again. Well, maybe it's happening, but I don't know. I do find it hard to be grateful to be in a cubicle. I would always rather be in a Victorian living room and, you know, somewhere in between would also be good. I'm gonna stop on Sunday night. I'm just gonna not, no, Monday mornings, I'm gonna stop going back there. This Sunday. Maybe, I'll let you know. Could be next week. There's a new pair of jeans I wanna buy. Bella